All right, shall we open our Bibles this morning to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, verse 11. And this week, we hope you'll go home with two things in mind. One, that God's timing is perfect, <clears throat> and that God's compassion for you is great. The studies of Luke that we've been going through are, are written by a Gentile doctor who relied upon eyewitness testimony to write his letter. He, he wasn't there. And yet he gathered them over a year or two, it seems, just to give us a further insight into the Lord's ministry. Last time we were together, we <clears throat> talked about the centurion in Capernaum where the Lord had moved his headquarters when he had been rejected there at Nazareth. A Gentile, a, a Roman asking the Jewish elders to go to Jesus to get help for a, a servant who was dying whom he loved as a son. In the process, we read something remarkable. The Lord said he hadn't found this kind of faith in all of Israel because this man realized he had limited power. His power allowed him to demand certain things of others, and sometimes things were demanded of him. But he said to the Lord, you don't even have to come to the house. We, we, I realized that one word from you, and this all gets turned around. <clears throat> in the story, and it was a short one, that we, we get three opinions. The, the, the Jewish elder said he's deserving. The centurion said of himself, I'm not worthy. And Jesus said, I've never found this kind of faith anywhere up to this point. It, it caused Jesus to marvel, we read. It's only used twice in the Bible here. God's marveling at the faith of this Gentile a centurion. And then we find it in Mark chapter 8 where <clears throat> the Lord, or actually, that's where the Lord says, go and your faith will be healed. And then we find it when he went to Nazareth. And he marveled at the unbelief of the people because they were so familiar with him. They somehow couldn't <laughs> take the lessons of him healing the sick and opening the eyes of the blind to heart. <clears throat> Excuse me. In, in verse 11, we read this. Now, it happened on the day after. So we are now on the, the next day that Jesus went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him. And there was a large crowd, and when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man who was being carried out, the only son of his mother, who was also a widow, and a large crowd from the city was with her. <clears throat> Nain is about 15 miles or so from Capernaum. It is uh, inland from the Sea of Galilee. It's kind of closer to Nazareth. But, but I want you to get a picture how the Holy Spirit just paints this picture. I, I, I've never seen a painting of it, but I thought it would be amazing that you had these two large crowds coming together at the gate of a city called Beautiful Nay. So at the same time as Jesus comes with a very boisterous, excited, you know, uh, happy people, he, they've seen a lot of great things, uh, out of the city at the same exact time comes a funeral procession. Coincidence? Well, that's hardly the case. And in fact, I think as we continue reading through here, <clears throat> we'll realize that the Lord had set this up. Had, he, had they come five minutes later, they would have never met, or five minutes too early, and it would have been the same thing. But God wants us to consider this, this meeting. In fact, notice it in verse um, 12, the word behold. It's one of those words that in Greek means stop right here and, and, and look around or, or pay particular attention. You know, let, let this, look closely, let this draw your attention to this meeting that takes place. God's timing is perfect. But the only people who realize that are, are, are God's people. If you are a believer and you have been reading your Bible and you know the Lord, you also know that his timing is never like yours, but it's always right. It is always perfect. You don't like it sometimes, but if you sit back and, and understand the heart of God that is, you know, that you are serving, that is watching over you, it is certainly the case that God's timing is, is always right. His spirit is always at work. His love is always driving his, his actions. When, when you, we were Wednesday night going through one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, the, the offering of, of, of uh, Isaac by Abraham, but in older age, and you know, right at the time that he was ready to kill his son, the, the knife was up in the air, God stopped him and, and said, I know now that you will hold nothing back for me. You trust me with everything. And there a, a ram 
caught in the thicket as God provides. Oh, he provided at the last minute. He pushed it to the end, but certainly it was the right time. When Eliezer in Genesis 24 was sent by Abraham to go back to the family to find a bride for his son, and Eliezer was just praying, Lord, you know, who, whoever sees me in the camels and offers to, to give not only just water to me, but to my camels, let he, her be the one that you've chosen. And it was just at that time that you read there, as he was finishing praying, that, that Rebecca came forth and she had a pitcher on her shoulder and she made the offer. And he, I wonder if this is the one. And God's timing was just absolutely perfect. I mean, Ruth experienced the same thing. She comes home and, you know, she's destitute, really dependent upon others. And you read in chapter 2, verse 3, that it just so happened <laughs> that the first day she went out to labor in the fields as a laborer, she walked into the, the field of what would eventually become her future husband as God kind of guided. So you, you read in verse 11, now it happened, and then you read in verse 2, behold. Just look at this setup <clears throat> from the Lord. Paul was in prison in Jerusalem. He had angered the crowds of the religious for some time, and they finally got him arrested for really nothing more than preaching. But while he was in jail there in Jerusalem, 40 men took an oath together that they wouldn't sleep, they wouldn't eat until they killed Paul. And so they banded together and they made this oath and that we're going to have him dead. Now, interestingly enough, as you read there through Acts chapter 23, as they were making this plan and, and discussing this among themselves, Paul's nephew walks by and overhears the plot. What, what are the likelihood of that? But he hears it and he goes to his uncle and says, here's Here's what I heard, and he sends uh, him to the authorities who move Paul away from Jerusalem, and uh, they watch over him, set him down at Caesarea and all. But, you know, God's timing is perfect. Your life in God's hand is more than just luck. In the world, they don't know, they don't recognize, they don't see it, but you should. But God has a plan, and his plan is right. It, it is wise for you and I to be constantly aware that God is doing the work. So that you don't get in you know, your car in the morning, it doesn't start, and you start cursing. Because, look, the Lord is in charge. Oh, all right, maybe you need to learn to charge the battery. But beyond that, you know, there are times that just out of your control that things take place. And because I've given my life to the Lord, I have to be aware and, and able to say, well, God must have a plan. When we first bought this building many years ago, there was a pumping station right in the corner of what is now our parking lot. It was a, another, or up against a, an office building for, a, for the telephone company. But in, it had an underground like pump that would take the water off the property, and it, it broke. And we were young in here, and we had a guy come, and he, I said, what's it going to cost to do new? And he said, $12,800. And we all, we don't have that kind of money. And so we just, Lord, what do we do? And that Sunday, I shared it, and the guy came up afterwards. He goes, oh, I do that for a living. Let me take a look at it. All right. He came back. He goes, here, it's the part you needed. I said, great. What does that cost? He said, $45. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Perfect time. Couldn't be happier. Thank you so much. When we bought the gas station on the corner, there was lots of remediation stuff that was going on. We needed to have a lawyer who was going to you know, develop this whole harmless agreement that we needed. Um, we didn't have one at the time. And so, uh, again, shared it with the body, prayed, and here comes this guy. He goes, oh, I do that for a living. I work for, and he worked for an old company. Let me just take a look at that. And we didn't cost us five cents. And the Lord just brought this guy in. In fact, he happened to be in town for a conference. He lived in San Francisco. So God has a way. You know, you just kind of sit and watch God's provision, and it's just, it'll blow your mind. But you have to have that eye that God is at work. You know, we have come... We have, we have seen people come to church on a, on a Sunday or a Wednesday, and you'll, they'll come up afterwards and say, oh, that message was just for me. And I'm thinking, yeah, that's, I knew you were coming, so I put it all together just for you. <laughs> of course not. I have no clue how to get here half the time, so don't give me any credit. But isn't it wonderful how the Lord knows what you need? And he speaks to you. We, we may, in the eyes of the world, you know, look, or the eyes of the world might not see our circ their circumstances as we do, but we should know that God has a perfect plan. All of us, every time, without fail, he has a perfect plan for us. Proverbs 16, I think it's verse 9, says, a, a man will plan his ways, but 
the, the Lord will direct his steps. That's true for you and I. It says in Psalm, same, same uh, no, not Psalm. Yeah, Psalm, no, it's Proverbs. 16.33. The lot is cast into the lap, but the decision, that's from the Lord. Or Proverbs 19, there, there are many plans in a man's heart, but the Lord's counsel will stand. So when you get to this little story and you, you read the Holy Spirit saying, hey, look at this. Look at how this thing came together. Look how the Lord developed this and took care of this then we would understand, you know, that, that we should begin to look around and, and, and assess our lives from the standpoint of, well, one thing I know is a Christian, God's in charge. And he has good plans for me. They're not evil. They're good for my good. They're driven by love. He has great power. And he does that for my benefit. At the Last Supper, Jesus um, was talking to the, the disciples about what lie ahead. And he said, you know, truly the Son of Man is going to go as it has been determined. But woe to him by whom he is betrayed. But, but the Lord makes reference to this plan of the Father. It is always God's plans. The early church certainly knew it. <clears throat> when the early church there in Acts chapter 4 were, were threatened with arrest and beatings or worse, they, they got together as a church to pray. And, and part of their prayers is listed there at the end of chapter 4 of, of, of Acts. But they, they said, Lord, we know... That, that because, you know, they have gathered against, against your holy child Jesus, whom you've anointed, and yet both Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and even the, the people of Israel have gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined to be done beforehand. It's good to know that God's got your life, isn't it? Rather than worry, oh, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't either. But I know who's got tomorrow. And we should rest in that and, and find great peace in that, find great rest in that. So um, I think you can sometimes miss the comfort of knowing that God's in charge because we, we're too busy complaining about what's going on. Or, or somehow, you know, we're not thankful, we're complaining. We're, we're not faithful, we're, we're being foolish. So behold, here's these two crowds. And like I said, they couldn't have been more different. Think about being in this crowd. Jesus had Thousands of people following him at this point. Now, they were not all there because they wanted to repent of their sins. They, they had, you know, maladies and demons and, and sicknesses and diseases. They were there, just touch me, help me. And, and the Lord, as you read through the Gospels, oftentimes seemed to help everyone who came. So the crowds were huge. They were loud. They were excited. They were up early. They traveled, it seems, maybe 15 miles with him even that very day. That's a long way to go in, in, as a group. But regardless, they came just as a huge, laughing, excited crowd who, who couldn't wait to see what was going to happen next. We love being with him. He's our, our joy. What a great day. And then they run smack dab into a funeral procession. Not exactly your laughing group. Not exactly smiles everywhere. It was very somber. They were carrying an open casket made of wood slats with an edge on the side, in which lay a young man who had died. There was no air of anticipation with them. There wasn't lots of talking with them. The boy was dead. His mom had just lost her only son, having already lost her husband. She was a widow. So she's made at least two trips to the graveyard. Once for her husband, now for her only son. The crowd we read was large. It was supportive. But really, what can you say to someone in that situation except to just kind of quietly be there for them for whatever they might need? You, you're just there to be supportive. There are two central figures here that brings the crowd together. One is Jesus, whose name is synonymous with life, and the people are following him to have him touch their lives. And then there's this dead boy who has gone the way of all men, gone to death, gone to the grave. A chance meeting, <laughs> unless you know the Lord, of two very large crowds at a walled city gate called Beautiful. Almighty God, who has come to give eternal life, running headlong into the consequences of sin and death. Behold, indeed, check, check this out. 
Verse 13 says, When the Lord saw her, he had compassion upon her, and he said to her, <clears throat> Do not weep. Now, Luke uses the word Lord here for the first time. The Greek word is kurios. It is a title of authority. It is the answer to the question, who's the boss? You are, Lord. There's no one like you. You have the last word. <clears throat> and she's about to learn, as is the big crowd with them, as the centurion did the week before, if he didn't know it already, that God is in charge, that Jesus is Lord Overall, But I want you to notice something. Jesus, in the midst of this huge, adoring crowd, sees this mother in tremendous grief, and her, his eyes are immediately drawn to her. That's who he focuses on. There are two other places in the Gospels where we find Jesus dealing with a woman and their only son. Do you know who they are? Just as extra credit, I'm not even going to tell you. You can just figure that out in your Jesus seeing what sin had done, because that's what sin had done, and seeing the sorrow in the heart and in the life of a mother was moved with compassion for this now widow who is now left childless as well. His heart is moved with compassion. Paul will write in Hebrews 4 uh, to the Hebrew believers, we do not have a high priest that cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. The Lord is very aware of what we're going through. He's very sympathetic towards the things that we suffer. He understands what we're going through. Isaiah, I think it's chapter 63, verse 9, says, In all of our afflictions, he's afflicted. So not only is God's timing perfect, he is very much aware of the difficulties that you find in this life. Very much aware. Drawn to you, if you will, in those situations. So that he might respond and, and care for you and, and watch over you. As a father pities his children, the psalmist writes, so the Lord pities those who fear him. He, he knows we're our, our friend. He remembers that we're just dust. In all of the commotion, thousands of people, we, we've been in Israel um, and tried to get in and out of some of the gates there that are very crowded and, and you can lose half your group, you know. We'll meet at the corner. It's just pushing and shoving. I can just imagine how this might have gone. So with all of the commotion, I, I want you to notice that Jesus' eye, verse 13, <clears throat> looks at her. Looks at her. Often life can leave you feeling fairly insignificant and, and lost in the crowd, especially if you're suffering loss, because suffering, if nothing else, isolates. You know, nobody feels the way you do at this point. No one really understands what you're going through. Uh, suffering pushes you into a corner. And, and if you're not aware of the Lord's, you know, nearness and promise, you, you come away thinking, you know, who cares about what I feel anyway? And the answer is Jesus does. And if that's your situation this morning, there may be a lot of people in the sanctuary, but I guarantee you his greatest concern is you. Because that's how the Lord works. He is drawn to our needs. So even as we gather, you know, why, why do you read so often in the scriptures that we should care for one another and look for them not just upon our own needs but upon others? Because that's what the Lord would do. Rather than run into the car and see if you can get out first, look around, see if anybody needs prayer, or just encouragement or a hug, you know. <laughs> we are a family. But, but Jesus, in the midst, and I can't just imagine the thousands of people his only concern was this poor woman. He knew her. He knew what was going on with her. And he cared for her. His heart went out to her. It is often because we lose sight of the compassion of God's heart that we become depressed. Well, woe is me. Look, what I, my life's falling apart. I become discouraged. I, I have that pity party. I'll even run away from the Lord, considering, you know, just concluding he doesn't care for me. I'm always amazed that when I haven't seen people in church for a while, and I see them again, I said, man, I've been missing you. Where have you been? They go, oh, I've really been going through. And I'm thinking, that's the time you ought to go to both services. You know, hang around, get people to pray for you, and you're going through it. Take advantage of the love, you know. Jesus has great compassion in times of trial, and he wants to give us rest, and he's moved towards this mother. 
And in the light of the circumstances, what he says is almost unbelievable. Stop crying. Time out. Lord, you've been good up to now. This is a funeral. I'm a widow. My son just died. Don't weep. I'm sorry. When should I weep? If not now. And it sounds so unreasonable. You know, at least in the first century, if you were a Jew, you could hire wailers for your funeral service. So if you didn't have enough family to cry, you could get professionals that would cry for you so that everyone would know how brokenhearted you were. And the greater the weeping, the greater the honor. you got to be kidding me. Don't weep. But, but look, the suggestions of the Lord are only unreasonable to those who don't know him. Because oftentimes, you know, unless you know the Lord, his suggestions in the Bible are a bit askew. For example, just rejoice in all trials. Hmm. I don't think that's a good idea. Be anxious for nothing. Love your enemy. Pray without ceasing. Stop crying. And why would I stop worrying, complaining, hating, and weeping? And the answer is, because the Lord is the Lord. And I can rest in Him. It's a great, the, the, to me, the picture is phenomenal. I, I'd love to see someone who could really paint, paint this. Jesus stops the procession. Don't cry. And then he comes, verse 14, and he touches the open coffin, and those who carried him stood still, and he said, young man, I say to you, arise. Wouldn't this give you a few goosebumps? Jesus comes up, stops the procession, leaves the admiring crowd behind, walks right into the, the grieving funeral march, grabs a hold of the open casket, and he's now to, about to do something, at least according to the law, Numbers 19, was, would leave him ceremonially unclean for the day. He'll have touched a dead body and gotten near one. He can't go to the temple, can't go to worship. However, if he rises, no harm, no foul. Now, no one had asked Jesus for help here. I think it's important. The motivation of the Lord was his love, not even a request. At least up to now in Luke, nearly everyone that had asked him for help, or everyone that had been helped, has asked for help. The fellow with the fever, the fellow with the leprosy, the paralytic, the centurion last time. In fact, aside from that man with a withered hand there in the synagogue in chapter 6, no, this was the only other time that the Lord just kind of intervened. He knew there was hurt. He knew there was difficulty. No one asked him to help, and, and nobody would have asked him to help. The, the fellow was dead. Too late now. Could have prayed while he was alive, but now he's dead. It's too late. You will remember later of the, after the, uh, at the ministry of, of Jesus, I think we're going to get there at the end of chapter 8 or so, to Jairus' daughter. In the midst of going over there to help his daughter who was sick, you may remember the woman with the issue of what blood just stopped the whole crowd for uh, several minutes. And, and, and the stopping seemed to, you know, have done the guy in because before they even turned around from her to go back on that journey to the house, someone came and said, just don't bother the master. She died. It's too late. You, you, you've stalled too long. And so while he was yet speaking, that's why they came. And then they said to them, don't, don't trouble him. And the Lord said, look, I tell you what. Don't be afraid. Just believe me. I, and, and she'll be made well. <laughs> okay. That sounds ridiculous too. So everyone here, no sense crying out to the Lord. The young boy had died. So they had the common view, which makes sense. And here the encouragement from Jesus to just trust him for even the impossible. So these two large crowds, the processional of the funeral and the, the happy-go-lucky group with Jesus, they all stop, <laughs> and all of their eyes go to him. And with love as his motivation, because he wasn't asked, and because he was God and his power was as God, Jesus speaks to the dead man, 
as if he's still listening, as if he still can respond, which is true, by the way. In all three cases of Jesus rising someone from the dead, Jairus' daughter, Lazarus, and here, that, that is the way that the Lord spoke to those who had died, as if they were still alive, and that's because they are. You know, you are a spirit. You live in a body. You get to rent this place. Aren't you glad you don't have to own this sucker? You know, it's falling apart, man. House ownership, it's no good. Look at, look at, look what it's doing to you. But one day, this body will arrive, this temporary dwelling place will arrive, and you'll get one who is made for eternity. You get to relocate. Don't know how you'll look then, but it'll look a whole lot better than you do now. And, and Paul was looking forward to that too. He, he saw death as just a changing of, of, of a place to live from a worn out body to a new body, a mansion. So Jesus says to this young man who is dead, get up, arise. And the spirit, subject to the Lord and to Jesus, obeys without question or debate, and he just immediately just sits up, which had to freak everybody out, I would think. By the way, in all three of these resurrection stories in the Bible, a simple command was enough and effective and immediate. Immediate. We had a church in town here 20 years ago. They used to have Sunday night raise the dead services. They disappeared. I guess nothing worked out for them. But, you know, if the Lord's in it, it doesn't require a lot of striving. It's his will. So we read in verse 15, so he that was dead sat up and began to speak. Ooh, I don't know. A little creepy. And he presented him to his mother. How awesome as Jesus, you know, intervenes. And now there are two very happy crowds, all either heading in or heading out of the city. But boy, the tone has sure changed. And Jesus sees the results of sin, and he presents himself as the one in whom you can find victory over the grave. And he brings life, and everyone sees it. That he's alone God. The one word for him and the dead rise. You believe, and, and salvation comes. It's a beautiful picture. Verse 16 makes perfect sense to me. Fear fell upon all. They began to glorify God by saying, a great prophet has risen up among us, and God has visited his people. And this report of him went throughout all of Judea and to all of the surrounding regions. Reverential fear, it seems to me, is no surprise. They began to glorify God, but how did they glorify him? If you read there in, in the text, they glorified him by recognizing Jesus for who he was. They saw Jesus for who he was. A great prophet has risen among us. Now, you know, or you should, that it had been 400 years, or about twice as long as America's been around, and there had been no prophet in Israel. Not a word from God, not a declaration from his throne, not power to be seen or verified until John the Baptist had come. And John the Baptist had stopped saying, well, there he is, there he is, there he is. He's the one. And now the Lord had begun to speak. This prophet that Moses had spoken about in, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, one that would come after him, that would be like him in that sense of, of declaration. When they asked John the Baptist, are you that prophet? He goes, no, but he is. And he pointed to Jesus. God has visited his people. That's exactly right. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. The, 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 the prophecy of Zechariah at the birth of John the Baptist when he declared, blessed is the God of Israel. He had visited and he has redeemed his people. And that was really what Jesus wanted these crowds to learn over the next three and a half years, who he was and that they should look to him and follow him. God's love had brought him here to die in our place. And that thought blew David's mind. He wrote in Psalm 8, you know, when I consider the heavens and the work of your hands, the moon and the stars, who is man that you are mindful of him? I, I can't believe that you would care so much for the likes of us. Well, verse 17 says, good news travels fast. And soon this story is being told in Judea, down in Jerusalem, about 80 miles to the south. Jesus' compassion, his infinite wisdom, his perfect timing, his absolute power, God has come. His name is Jesus. And he that rules in eternity will raise the dead in sin to life. 
one day we'll get to stand before him and he'll get to answer for us. So, what do we know? Well, we know that God's in charge of our lives. If you have given Jesus your life, nothing just happens. God does things very purposefully. You are his workmanship, as we read in Ephesians, created to do good works, which he has or before ordained that you should walk in them. So God has plans. I, I, I would say to you, begin to live your life every day, every morning, saying, God, I know you're in charge. Whatever comes today, I'm looking to you. And then know this, in the midst of those challenges, God does only things based on his love. He'll do it without asking. He'll do it because he's for you. His heart is moved with compassion. He, he knows what you're going through. And he would say to you this morning, don't worry, don't cry, don't strive, don't make it difficult on yourself. I'm in charge. And you say, unreasonable. You don't know what I'm going through. And my answer to you is, it's only unreasonable if you don't know who he is. Only if someone other than God would suggest that to you, I get it. But if he's the Lord of all, and even in a crowd of joyful, believing hearts, his heart and his eyes and his desire and his compassion is drawn to the one in the crowd who no one seems to be able to relate to. But, but that's all he cares about. So if you're sitting in a pew this morning, your life is having a difficult time, but know this, God is focused on you this morning. Does that make you feel better? It should. Father, thank you this morning for your word to us. What a good story, Lord. How, how, how important we learn that, that you do all things well, that you are, are, are a God of, of, of every situation, that as we look to you, you, you set everything up. Nothing just happens. The world may not see it, but your people do. And that when things are allowed in our lives, that you do them for a reason, that if we'll, we'll come, just look to you and worship you, we'll find what that is, and we'll, we'll find the best in it. So may you remind us again this morning that, Lord, you, you are not only the God of good timing, but you're a God driven by tremendous compassion and, and, and love for us. Now, I would say to you, if you don't have a relationship with God, then none of those things apply because you'll never be able to see his heart. You don't know who he is. And so you find yourself, you know, constantly warring against life. But God has a plan. And if you'll come to Jesus and, and you'll ask him to be the Lord of your life, the Lord, the kurios, who's the boss? You are, Lord. If you'll invite him in to save you, he'll come. And then you'll be able to look at life differently. He'll be in charge of your life. You'll, you'll find his promises in, your, in his word you'll find great relief at his feet. You'll find great compassion amongst his people. You'll find great uh, affirming goodness in the heart of God towards you as you come to know his son. Pastors will be up front after the service. We'd love to pray with you that you would just surrender your heart this morning to Jesus Christ. If you're watching online, if you'll, if you'll follow the links in the description box at the bottom there, then you'll be taken to the page that we'll be sharing with folks here in the sanctuary as well. Good to know God's in charge. Have your way, Lord, with us, we pray.